Heavenly Father, what a privilege and an honor to come together amongst the brothers and sisters to praise you. We lift up this day to you. It is Shabbat. It's a day of rest. We praise you and worship you today. And be with Bill and Beth. Be with the worship team. And may you be glorified in all that we say and do today and that we keep our eyes focused and our minds focused on you. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Good morning, family. Buenos dias. Wow, you guys are getting gooder and gooder. Sorry, Miss Beth. She's right there. Oops. It's all good. See, it's all good. She said it's all good. Good to see everybody smiling and grinning. If you're not smiling, look to your neighbor and say, do I got some of my teeth? Good to be in the house of the Father. I was glad when they said, let us come into the house of the Lord. Amen. I was so glad. And to think at one time we used to shun this, like, wow, what was I thinking? We weren't, but praise Abba. He's given us his mind and his salvation is ours because of Yeshua. We're grateful and thankful. Let us sing. Let us sing. Mato.
שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, שלום. שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, שלום, שבת, 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 שלום, שבת, שלום. Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Hine ma tovu manai Shevet achim gam yakai Hine ma tovu
wrestling in my doubt, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. Y'all better run. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, oh. You are the peace in my troubled sea.
perfect union Nothing in between I am yours and you are
Spirit of Jesus Living within us Never fail or forsake Unending promise Heaven inside us Whispers the sound of your
God of promises that you do what you say you're gonna do thank you Yahweh that your name is great that we father belong to you that you have called us as your own a set apart people to do thy will father what a wonderful father you are in our sin father you reached out father and picked us all up <laughs> we didn't deserve that father we never deserve that but I thank you and we thank you father for lifting us up thank you for Yeshua thank you for our Messiah thank you for redeeming us thank you for what you do for us every single day that you're there to pick us up to encourage us to lead us to guide us like a good shepherd that you are thank you for your immense love what else could we do father but to thank you and to praise you and to glorify you for you are the great I am the promise keeper what you have spoken over every single one of us Papa I know you will do we know that you will do it father and we rejoice because of that and we're thankful for it father we thank you father though we don't see it in the natural yet we believe it father we believe that our loved ones are walking with you father we believe those that are sick are healed father we believe father that those that are in debt you have delivered them from that debt father we believe that you are the God of miracles you're the God the same yesterday today and forevermore we believe you father because you promised you would take care of us and you never ever stop you never ever stop you always keep your word we're thankful father in Yeshua's mighty name amen just everyone remain standing and together let's recite the Shamanu. and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak thou also unto the children of Israel saying verily my Sabbath you shall keep for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. In Mark 12, it says that one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Gentlemen. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Everyone together. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Baruch Shem And his glorious kingdom forever. They are hunted, I don't 
While we get the chuppas ready, that you turn and greet someone, say hello, Shabbat Shalom. All right, if we can get our itty bitties, all of our sons and daughters gathered up here. If you're home and your little ones are nearby, won't you gather them close to you? Also, um, where's that treasure box? It's over, it's over there? Okay, all right, so over there. Okay, just making sure. All right, so if you're here, please, and you can and will stand. But at any rate, everybody extend your hands toward our sons and daughters. Let's pray this blessing over them. May the Lord protect and defend you. And 
May he always shield you from shame And may you come to be in Israel a shining Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your your rest, Father. Thank you, Father, for these young lives that you have put in our care. Father, we just ask that you would guide us to guide them and lift them up, protect them, show them the way. And Father, we just ask that you would uh, bless their lives as you have blessed ours. And we lift you up as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we're returning to our seats, let's make certain that we, uh, if, if need be, squeeze in. Make sure everybody's got a place to sit. Uh, looks like we've still got plenty of chairs, but... Uh, all right, I'll give it just a moment for everybody to get their seat, get situated. So I understand that there is a another Bill and Beth in the uh, the audience today. Is that right? Where are you? So they, everyone meet Bill and Beth. <laughs> Rice. Okay, where are you guys from? Udawa. Okay. Can we fix that? They were trying to, oh, oh, they were trying to help. My, my apologies. 
Well, go ahead and put them back to where they were because I can't see those folks now. All right. So is it Ultawa or Ultawa? Right? <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Seriously, can we bring the lights back up? No, it's different. All right. All right. <laughs> and that's what matters, right? Okay. All right. Well, good morning. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you. for Good to see everyone here. I hope you've had a good week. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. I know we've had some very uh, interesting occurrences here recently in the world. There's some very interesting things getting ready to happen. Um, but we're going to talk about pig's feet. <laughs> now, you need to understand, growing up in South Georgia, <laughs> that can mean a lot of things. Uh, am I right, Bob? Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> All right, well, anyway. All right, well, let's pray. Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, that you have set aside, you sanctified it, you blessed it, and you said that we should enter into that rest. So we, we thank you for that opportunity to come and to commune with you, to fellowship with your people. As we do, Father, may it be that we truly lay aside everything that happened this past week. May we set aside all those things that we anticipate having to deal with this coming week. So that this time together, that we truly would exhibit in our life that you are our first love, that it's not just mere words, but that it is the, the cry of our heart, that we truly do want more of your presence in our life, that it won't be just words that we sing, but it would be the cry of our heart. Father, that in all things you are, you're sanctified, you're blessed, Everything we've sung this morning, everything we will sing, everything that is spoken, everything that is prayed, may it be pleasing in your sight. May it honor you. May it sanctify your great name. And in all things, let Yeshua be lifted up, our Redeemer and King. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so we begin our Torah portion, Shmini. Shmini, which means eighth. It begins in Leviticus chapter 9. Verse 1 is going to go over into chapter 11. It's called the 8th because it's referring to the 8th day uh, from the time that Aaron and his son, or after Aaron and his sons had been inaugurated into the priesthood. And so eight days later, or on the 8th day after their inauguration, it says in verse 1, And it came to pass on the 8th day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering, and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering. Also a bull and a ram as peace offerings, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil. And here's what we're going to emphasize as we begin. For today the Lord will appear to you. So, so take note that they were to do certain things in preparation of the Lord's appearance. And the, the way the Hebrews constructed there, it says that he will appear. It's in the perfect tense, meaning that it is a sure thing. It's going to happen. It's not a if he appears, it is he is going to appear. And so then the leaders were called upon, the elders were called upon to do what was necessary, to do what was appropriate in order to make certain preparations, not so that he would appear, but because he will appear. Now that's something you and I need to take to heart. It's not an if he's gonna come back. It is he is coming back, right? It's not if he is Lord, he is Lord, right? And so constant, yeah, that's, that's a good, you can do that. And so then there are things that we should be doing. There, sh there are things that we need to be preparing for. And um, <sighs> there are a lot of people that when, when certain things begin to happen in the world, you know, like Monday's going to be a big day, right? Um, 
Some people get the idea, well, this is our time to hunker down, you know, uh, make sure that we got everything until the smoke clears and, and survive. And keep in mind, you and I, I can't find it in Scripture anyway, you and I are not called to be survivors, right? We're called to be overcomers, right? So let's keep that in mind. Because, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are convinced that this solar eclipse is going to occur on Monday. It's the harbor during the end. Some people are expecting Messiah to be right behind it and all these kinds of things. And I don't, I'm not trying to make fun, but remember, no one knows the day or the hour, right? In fact, it says it'll be in an hour that you think not, right? So I take that to mean when I'm not thinking about it, that's when he's going to come. Which then means, if I'm thinking about it, he's not going to come right then. <laughs> Seems pretty simple to me. All right, so when the solar eclipse happens and everybody's thinking about it, get ready for Tuesday. <laughs> All right. However, however, we're not to just, just you know, ignore this because one of the things Yeshua said would be happening in the days and leading up to his return is that there would be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, right? That we are to look at these things that are going on in the heavens, these things that are going on in the earth, and to realize that when these things are beginning to happen, you know that redemption is at hand. And I do find it interesting that this particular eclipse is going to coincide with the new moon, which will be that evening, Right? And this particular new moon will be Rosh Chodesh Aviv. Aviv, as far as the months go, is the head of the year. So, happy new year, <laughs> right? And so, it's almost like God's way of saying, uh, happy new year, everybody. I'm getting ready to do some stuff. Something, just something to keep in mind. It's just another reminder that his return is not conditional. His return is it's it's just absolute okay when not when i'm thinking about it when when i'm not thinking about it but he is coming and knowing that he's coming we need to be making certain preparations it's as the prophet said malachi chapter 3 verse 1 behold I send my, mess, my messenger, in fact, that's what Malachi means, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Again, it's a sure thing. He is coming, and consequently, you and I are charged with preparing the way. Just as John was the voice in the wilderness, making the crooked path straight, preparing the way, preaching repentance, you and I also need to be declaring that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But not just preaching everybody else. We need to take that to heart for ourselves. If we truly believe the kingdom of heaven is at hand in the sense that he is coming, then we need to be busy making the crooked path straight in our own lives as well as in the body. He will appear to those, Malachi said, to those who are seeking or looking. If you're not looking, if you're not thinking about, if you're not, you know, pondering that, and if you're not, you know, if you're not embracing the idea that, you know, he is coming one day and probably sooner rather than later, then we need to be living as if he were going to come today, tomorrow, Monday, right? That's how we need to be living. We need to be preparing for his appearing because that's who he is going to appear to, those who are seeking, those who are looking, those who are preparing for him. In Hebrews 9, it says that he will appear to those who eagerly wait for him or eagerly hoping for him might be another way to, to render that. So I hope that you're hoping. I hope that you're longing for that. I hope that you're pining for that. I don't like this world the way it is. All right? Um, and so I want him to come and put it back the way it's supposed to be. Right? But in order for me to be able to enjoy that, I need to be put back the way he intended me to be, right? All right, so then, you, you, this, these are things you all know. In our waiting, there should not be any idleness. We're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, right? Or shouldn't be, because we are to occupy 
until he comes. And you've heard me say this many, many times. We don't occupy until we think he's going to come. We occupy until he comes. So right up until that moment. Because when he comes, he will expect to find us being about his father's business. Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And do you know what faith is, right? Y'all going to quote Hebrews chapter 11 to me now. <laughs> but let's put it in very plain Simple, easy to understand terms. Faith is this. I heard what he said, and I'm going to do what he said. Hearing and doing. Being about our father's business. So back to the Torah portion. Moses told Israel certain things had to be in order in preparation for the Lord's appearance. The first 10 chapters of Leviticus, Vayikra, are these laws pertaining to the sanctuary, things that they had to know, things they had to understand, things they had to execute, things that had to be done because the Lord was going to appear. The beginning of this portion um, kind of uh, emphasizes certain sacrifices that were to be brought on behalf of the priest, on behalf of the people, things that were to be placed or these offerings that were to be placed on the altar. These things had to be done because the Lord was going to appear. But then the Torah portion also talks about things that shouldn't be done because the Lord is going to appear. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. The Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So this is very uh, familiar to most of us anyway. But let's talk about it a little bit within the context of there are things that you and I need to be doing in anticipation of the fact that he will appear. And then there are some things that we don't need to do in anticipation of the fact that he will appear. So offering profane or strange fire is one of those things that we do not need to do. So let's show the Hebrew for this, uh, this term profane or strange fire. It's esh zarah. Esh is the word for fire, zara. It's the word that is translated profane or strange. And what that phrase means is that they offered something that was not consecrated, something God had not commanded. It was not mandated. Put in uh, simple terms, they did what was right in their own eyes. And how many times do we read in Scripture when people do what is right in their own eyes, the re end result is not very good. But that's what these two priests did. Now, let's go to Hebrew class for just a little bit. The entomology of the word zara, zayn resh he. The entomology of this word, or you know, the root from which it comes, is related to turning aside. Scripture talks about people who will quickly turn aside. They'll turn from what is right, and they'll go into what is wrong. They'll follow their own eyes, their own inclination. They turn aside. That's what the root word actually um, is, is, is about, turning aside from the truth. And then consequently, this same term is used to translate the idea of being scattered or being separated. What happened to Israel when they turned aside from following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and went after other gods? They were scattered among the nations. They were separated from the land. They were, more importantly, they were separated from God in the sense that they had broken covenant. So from that, we get the idea of foreign, strange, profane. Things that were not commanded, things that were not consecrated, things that are connected to the idea of us doing things in a way that we deem appropriate. This word is also translated as something that is to be loathed. I guess that's a fancy word for hate. Something that should be abhorred, something that should be avoided. Which then leads to this. This same word, zara, is also translated as a prostitute. So... That kind of makes it a little more real, right? What they were doing, as far as the words that are used here in the text, they were offering something that in a sense, God would look upon as you're bringing a prostitute into my house. There is this relation. 
they offered something that was, by God anyway, considered to be unclean. So here's a reminder for you and for me. We need to be careful about what we offer unto the Lord. According to Romans chapter 12, it is to be holy and acceptable, which means that there can be things that are, in God's eyes, unacceptable, things that he would not regard as holy. And so we need to be very careful about the offering that we're bringing to the Lord. We need to make certain that he sees it as being holy and acceptable, not how we view it. And so we need to be very careful about this, and especially if our offering appeals to our flesh. If our offering um, is appealing to the soulish part of who we are. In other words, just because it sounds good, just because it looks good, just because it feels good, doesn't mean it is good. In fact, if it's feeding our egos, it probably isn't good. If it feeds our ego, it probably isn't an acceptable offering. So on that note, I want you to consider that this same Hebrew word, the, 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 their family words, some are pronounced a little differently, but they basically have the same root. But in, the family, in, in this uh, family, there is a word, that, a related word, that means something that radiates. In other words, something that shines, something that sparkles. And so we have the word zer, which is zayin resh. Notice the only thing missing here is the hay on the end. But zer is a crown. And why a crown? Because, you know, crowns typically are something that radiate. They're, they're shiny. They're sparkly. And what are they supposed to say? This is someone who has authority, right? This is someone who has um, a particular influential position in whatever the setting may be. But something that looks good isn't always good, is it? Sometimes it can be profane. Sometimes it can be unclean. Which then, when I was putting this together this morning, reminded me of something else we've talked about from time to time, and that is the word kadosh compared to the word kadesha. Kadosh, kuf, dalit, vav, shin. Kadosh, holy, set apart. But if you just put the hay on the end of that and make it the feminine form of the word kadesha, it means harlot. Because you see, a harlot is set apart for something else. And so the fact that these two words can look so similar to one another and yet mean something so different should tell us that not everything that looks good is good. Not everything that sparkles is good. Not everything that glitters is gold, right? Because this is how the adversary operates. He wants everybody to look at the good part of the tree and ignore the death that's awaiting you if you partake of that particular tree. In Revelation chapter 17, the scarlet-clothed woman, you know, who is, you know, compared to the sun-clothed woman. The sun-clothed woman, she's in travail. She brings forth the male child who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But the scarlet-clothed woman, she's adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and all those things that are attractive to the eye. All those things that appeal to our flesh. All those things that sparkle and shine. But she's also holding in her hand a golden cup. And that golden cup is full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, it says. Kadosh, Kadesha. And if you're just glancing and not really paying attention, you may not see the distinction until it's too late. So this is a lesson that goes all the way back to the beginning. The garden, that sacred space, that space that God planted and then he put the man in it to take care of it and to... Guard it, protect it, defend it, right? Because it was sacred. And so obviously if he puts him there to not only tend it, to work it, to make it, what it do what it's supposed to do, but also defend it and guard it and protect it, that must mean there is something or someone out there that it has to be protected from. And that something or someone probably is very desperate to get inside and undermine what's going on in the garden. So here we find in Genesis chapter 3, who's, who's in the midst of the garden? It's, it's the serpent, right? In Hebrew, nachash, which also means shining. 
right? So he's in the garden, appearing as something attractive, something shiny, but whose words are full of venom. So I want to tell you a story. Um, and I hope I don't get too long-winded with this. But the more I've thought about this, is I'm like, okay, I think there's some things for me to learn and maybe all of us to glean from. Here, uh, well, Beth and I are coming up on about 10 years that we lived on this property up in McMinn County. And for about eight or nine of those years, we've been talking about planting an orchard. In fact, we cleared off some, a little section of this property for, just for that reason. And we kept talking about it. And we talked about it some more. <laughs> and then we talked about it some more. We talked about it some more. And then that little section of property has seen other things go on there. You know, they had nothing to do with an orchard, you know. So, I don't know. Finally, just, I was just overwhelmed here uh, a couple of months ago. This is the year. We're going to do it. We're going to plant an orchard. And I went back and forth about where and all this kind of stuff. But I, I landed back at this particular section of the property that we had first thought would be, be where the orchard was. Now, you need to understand that this particular part of the property, um, it's not the best of ground. It's kind of... The ground can be a little hardened in some places. And uh, that, there had been a bunch of trees there that, you know, got cut down and everything. But anyway, this is where, you know, I was going to plant the orchard. And I, I'd kind of just let it go. But I decided if we're going to put the orchard here, I'm going to have to reclaim that territory. See, I hadn't really been guarding it. A lot of stuff had grown up in it. You know, thorns and briars and thistles and weeds and all those kinds of things. The ground was hard and, you know, it was just not what she would, oh, that looks like a great place to put an orchard. No, actually, that looks like the last place you want to put an orchard. Yeah. But I thought, well, this is where it's going to be. And so, well, it's going to take a lot of work to kind of get it ready so that we can plant some trees. So yesterday, um, I, and I had some help, went about getting this ready. And so some stuff had to be pushed out of the way. Some stuff had to be moved out of the way. And at one point, I started working along the fence line. And along the fence line, there's everything you can imagine, stuff that just got piled up there, stacked up there, wood, sheet metal, barrels, you know, pallets, the whole bit. So I'm down to getting, there's some pieces of sheet metal. And briars and thorn bushes have just, taken over, right? And so I'm fighting that, and it's gotten all entangled around the sheet metal. And so this one piece, I was down there, and I was fighting that thing five, ten minutes, you know, and I have to cut this and pull that out, and I'd pull on it a little more, and the thorns are cutting at me, and I'm, rah, 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 you know, all this kind of stuff. And so finally, I got this one piece of sheet metal, and I got it, and I pulled it out, and as soon as I pulled it out, Right there was this pretty little copperhead. <laughs> I would imagine he was between two and three feet long. And he was just kind of sitting there right where my hands and my feet had been all this time. And I, I stepped back. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and the first thing that went through my mind is I'm glad it's cold this morning. Because he was moving rather slow. Now, this story might get a little long-winded, but I have a point, all right? Now, I thought it was a copperhead, but I wanted to make sure. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> because you see, I'd never seen a copperhead on our property, ever, ever, ever. Now, there have been several corn snakes who have met their demise when we encountered one another because... At that time, well, corn snakes, I, I thought they looked like copperheads. And so when I would see the corn snakes, which aren't venomous, you know, they're actually kind of good to have around. But they looked a lot to me, they looked a lot like copperheads. And so my philosophy at that point in time was shoot first and ask questions later. <laughs> so, again, several corn snakes have, have met their demise when we run into one another. So I'm thinking, well, well maybe this is a corn snake. So I got Danny Baker's attention. I said, come here and look, because he's from Arkansas. You know? 
<laughs> so, so I said, come here, look at this snake. Is it a copperhead? And because his head was kind of, you know, concealed and Danny's looking over there and all of a sudden that thing showed its head and he's like, yeah, that's a copperhead. So the copperhead quickly became no head. And he was quickly dispatched to the infernal regions. <laughs> so there's another piece of sheet metal laying there. So now both Danny and I are on guard, right? So we lift that piece of sheet metal up and pull it out. And sure enough, there's another one. Don't know if it was mommy or daddy, but it too joined its companion. <laughs> and the copperhead became headless. All right? So I got to thinking. You know, it was, it was a no-brainer to me. You can't stay here. You know, and so I know that some people are like, well, aren't they God creatures too? <laughs> yeah, they are, but they were in the wrong place. <laughs> when I'm going walking in the woods, I'm not looking for copperheads to mess with. Now, I'm going to watch out for them, but I'm not looking to find any. If they'll leave me alone, I'll leave them alone. You go your way, I'll go my way, just leave me alone. However, they were in my sacred space. They were in my, what's going to be, my little garden area, my little orchard area, where I hope that one day, if the Lord allows, I'm going to be able to walk around in the breezy part of the day and freely eat of the fruit that he has... <laughs> Provided, which means that I cannot coexist with a copperhead. Well, that was the whole idea. <laughs> Beth said, well, that'll preach. And I'm like, well, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. Why don't you just throw them in the woods? Because like every other living thing, when they're disoriented and lost, they will try to find their way back home. They'll try to find their way back to where they think is home. And these copperheads had took up residence in my sacred space, in my orchard, in my garden, whatever you, word you want to use. And I cannot coexist with that. Right? So, no, it wasn't. I'm just going to throw them in the woods because eventually they're going to come back. The goat for Azazel was not just led out into the wilderness. It was led out into the wilderness and then tossed over a cliff to make sure that it was not going to come back, right? Yeshua was not going to just kick the serpent out of the garden. No, he was going to crush his head and destroy the works of the devil. We cannot coexist with copperheads in our sacred space, y'all. So, for all of us, you know, this is what I have taken away from that, you know. Maybe there are some areas of our life that we need to reclaim, that we've just kind of let it go and hadn't guarded it, you know what? And there might be that some copperheads have taken up residence in places they're not supposed to be. But maybe we need to reclaim that. And it's going to take a little work, but we can't coexist with those copperheads. We need to cut their head off and get them out of our sacred space. I'm not going to, you know, pet and coddle something that has the ability to inject venom in me. I'm going to get rid of it. So if we pet and coddle the copperhead too long, don't be surprised if you get bit. All right? That's kind of what's in my gut this morning. This isn't the main part of my message. But we all need to be very, very careful that that snake you're petting and coddling, don't be surprised if you get bit. The more important thing is, after you get bit, what do you do? Well, all this reminded me of a passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. He who digs a pit will fall into it. And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. So, you know, I wasn't working at a wall. I was working at a, a fence row because apparently they like that. 
But, I, but it reminded me of this passage. So the rabbinical idea behind this verse, for what it's worth, is it's a parable. And it's a parable about those who plot against others. They dig a pit for the other person, but they end up falling into it. They break down a wall as to encroach on someone else's property or sacred space, we'll put it that way. And they, they break through the wall to, to do that, and in, in the process, they get bitten by a snake. And so when I'm reading this, it's interesting that the word zara, that word that means profane or strange, all those things, is also a, or related to a word or has a family word that means an edging or a fence. So there are things that like to hang around the fence trying to get in that don't need to be in. And sometimes they take up habitation. They take up residence there. And again, maybe it's, there's some of us that maybe just need to, you know what? I've kind of let that go. I hadn't been guarding that the way I'm supposed to, but today's the day. And I'm gonna go in and start cleaning this stuff out and getting these things out and watch around, or watch along the borders. That's where they're going to be. That's what it says here. So, Zorah, interesting, edging or fence. Because these people in the parable, digging a pit that they fall into, breaking the wall, they get bit by a snake. What they were up to was what was profane in the eyes of the Lord. They were not paying attention to the boundaries that the Lord had established, which now brings us back to Nadav and Avihu. They did not recognize or have respect for certain boundaries that the, that the Almighty had in place. They ignored the boundary, and guess what happened? They got bit. They got consumed. Maybe I should put it that way. Now, there are varying opinions as to uh, what it was that they had done and when they offered strange fire, and there's opinions as to why it happened. One of the more common ideas is that they had, had become intoxicated. And that idea is bolstered by the next verse, Leviticus 10, verse 9, which God instructs Aaron that when you and the priest come into the sanctuary, do not drink wine. So it kind of hints at the fact that maybe his two sons had been, you know, imbibing a little too much as they're on duty and they go in and if they're under the influence of alcohol, that's going to kind of impair their judgment. We can get in days before... When we did those kinds of things, you remember what happened. I'm fine. I can drive, right? We, have, we don't have the best of judgment when we're in those kinds of situations, right? So that maybe is what happened. They had become intoxicated. The bottom line is this. Fire, lightning flash, whatever it was, destroyed them. And in doing that, God made it a very divine statement. Verse 3 of chapter 10. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. His sons did not respect that boundary. And he, as a father, had to stand by, keep his mouth closed when all this happened. Why did God do that? I do not believe it happened because God is cruel. I don't think it happened because God is mean. It happened because God is holy. He is holy and we must regard him as such. Our families must regard him as such. We all should very, pay very close attention to the fact that just because it looks good, look, just because it sparkles and shines, just because it's pretty, doesn't mean it's clean, doesn't mean it's holy. But leaders in particular must regard him as holy, and especially in the eyes of the people. Because if he relaxed his standards for anybody, then I would argue he's not holy. Holy means set apart. Nothing unclean touches him. And so he could not relax his standards and allow these two to come in with something that was profane and strange into his presence because if he had allowed that, then we could make the argument that he is not holy, that he compromises. Now, is he merciful? 
Yes, of course. Is he compassionate? Yes, he is. Is he long-suffering? Yes, he is. Is he forgiving? Yes, he is. Is he holy? And he must be regarded as holy by those who approach him. So he makes a statement here. Nadav, one of the two men, his name or the meaning of his name is very interesting to me. It means generous, but it's, it's uh, derived from a word that means liberal, to make willing. And that was just like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> By liberal, it means this, you know, kind of, well, really, why can't I do that? You know, not being very strict and not being very rigid about it. Kind of being open-minded to things. And it's one thing to be open-minded. It's another thing to be so open-minded that anything goes. Right? And so it seems to me that thinking liberally, or too liberally, maybe I should put it that way. Thinking too liberally in regard to the Creator can be hazardous to your health. Well, God understands. I can do this. I'm thinking how I want to say this. I remember my father coming into my bedroom when I'd be playing some of my music. And he would, well, I couldn't really hear what he was saying. <laughs> I saw his mouth move. I saw the red in his face and I saw it. I got the message. And I'm not, I'm not advocating going back and listening to the music, some of the music that I listened to back in those days because some of it was not good and I quit listening to some of that bad stuff. But some of the music they, music they got out today, it's just, oh, they can say that and they do. And here is what I was going to say. This is true for us all, but young people, if your Spotify has a praise song and right under it something from some rap gangsta and it's got that big E next to it. I know I'm old, but I know what that E means. It means explicit lyrics where they just get filthy and vulgar. Don't, don't tell me that you're going to lead a Bible study and when your Spotify has got a praise song right next to something that's filled with every vulgar and vile word you can think of. That, to me, encroaches on the idea of strange fire. God is holy and he doesn't relax his standards for any of us just because it might seem right to us. God holds his people to account. He holds his people to a standard and particularly those who are in leadership. He holds them to the strictest of standards. In fact, the greater the man is in the kingdom, the more God's gonna require of him. Let me read you a passage. Luke 12, verse 47 and 8. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. <laughs> and there's some people around that don't believe in spankings. <laughs> but he who did not know, yet, committing, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with a few. So there are people who know and they don't do. Their consequences are gonna be more severe than those who didn't know and still did. The people who didn't know, there's still a consequence. As Barney Fife would say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> right? There still are going to be consequences, but there are fewer. Than. So the point is, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. God expects those who have been given a lot to do a lot. He expects, he requires certain things of those who have been appointed to a particular situation, ministry, position, what have you. Those who have been anointed to do certain things. He expects a proper response. Because he, he is either going to be sanctified in the eyes of people or he's going to be profaned in the eyes of people. It's one or the other. So then when leaders, and I say that word very, very broadly here, 
I'm not just talking about people who are pastors. I'm not just talking about people who are worship leaders. I'm talking about people who are, it, it, this can apply to moms and dads, and it can apply to teachers, and you know, all, this whole array of different positions and functions in the body. When we give in to our emotions and we are ruled by emotions and the soulish part of us, we're prone to setting a very bad example. Moses was to speak to the rock, right? But he was mad at the people, and so what did he do? He hit the rock, and because he was angry at the people, he hits the rock, and God says, you will not go into the land because you did not hallow or sanctify me in the eyes of the people. He wasn't allowed to go into Canaan because at that moment, he gave into his emotions, and he left a bad example before the people. But at least, you know, he wasn't just disqualified altogether. On the other hand, you've got two guys like Hophni and Pincus, the sons of Eli, the high priest, in the days of Samuel, who gave into their emotions as well and their passions and their uh, evil inclinations so much. These are priests, mind you, that the result for them was very different, and they died. They paid for it with their lives. So the point here is that whatever we're called to, whatever gift God gives us, whatever position of influence God gives us in the kingdom, or whatever the function is, he expects us to regard him as holy, to approach him as being holy, to not do what is right in our own eyes or what is convenient for us or what is, you know, it makes sense to me, let's just do it this way, even though the Bible maybe says this. Well, you know, the times have changed and things are different now and all this nonsense. That's that little copperhead you're petting and you're deciding to coexist with it. If I did that, that'd be my little copperhead deciding to, in that sacred space to say, it's okay for us to kind of live here together. No, it's not. Because one day I'm going to be out there picking apples off my tree, and I'm going to walk on that copperhead, and I'm not going to see him this time, and he's going to bite me. It can't happen. We're going to need to do everything in our power to make certain that that kind of a situation doesn't happen. But it happened, in a sense. Native and Evihu, they offered this strange, foreign, profane fire, and God consumed them. And Aaron is, is having to just stand there, watch this tragedy unfold, and hold his peace. Either he had no answer, nothing to say, or he just resigned himself to it. But Moses said, don't say anything. You're wearing priestly garments. The anointing oil of the Lord is on you. You, you cannot, you're going to have to keep things here in, in order. You're a high priest. Your responsibility as high priest takes precedent right now. He's admonished not to mourn that. He, Moses gets other kinsmen to haul these two bodies out of the sanctuary. And I know that some people read that. It seems so rough, seems so cruel. Remember, it's not because God is cruel is because God is holy and God will not be mocked. So we cannot allow our emotions to outweigh our duty to the Almighty. There is a heavy price to pay for being one of his. I mean, the salvation part of that's the free gift, right? But he also says, count the costs. If you're going to take up your cross and follow me, it's going to cost you. And what is it going to cost us? Everything, right? So there's a heavy price to pay for being one of his. It seems to me there's even a little heavier price to pay to be if you're a leader of any, in, in any capacity. And understanding that and understanding the, the kind of people that God has chosen in times past, people like Moses, that's why I'm always a little cautious of people who want to be a leader. I'm a little wary of people who want to be in the limelight. I'm a little wary of people who want to be out in front of everybody. Because it, it just, I don't know, makes me feel icky. <laughs> because it reminds me of somebody said, I will ascend into the heavens. I will be like the most high. All right, let's bring it back to Nadav and Abihu. Are you still with me? Yes. 
If they did offer strange fire because they were intoxicated and their mental clarity was uh, compromised in some way, then we need to take note that what we ingest, what we eat, drink, physically, more importantly, spiritually, can have grave consequences. So back to my copperhead story. You know, there are some things that are venomous. There are some snakes that are venomous and there are some snakes that are not venomous, right? But the point here is snakes aren't poisonous. They're venomous. See, if, you, if it bites you and you get sick, it's because they are venomous. But if you bite something else and you become sick, then you have been poisoned. Are you following me here? So the snake bites you, it's because there's venom in those fangs. But when you turn around and bite something else, especially if God said, don't mess with that, and you get sick, it's because you have been poisoned. What's the difference here? What's the distinction? Who is doing the biting? All right? Eve was bitten by the serpent in the sense that she allowed the words of the serpent to penetrate her heart. They were venomous in that, in that sense. But then what did she do? She turned around and she ate something. She bit something. And God had said, don't. And consequently, she was poisoned. Then that led her to tempt somebody else to do the same thing. And then dummy, he took it and he bit it. And he brought sin and death on all of us, right? Now, what would have happened? Well, there's a lot of different things that we could ask here. What if Adam had done what he was supposed to do in the first place and had guarded the garden? All right, maybe the, maybe the serpent's not there in the first place. But what if she had just quit listening to the serpent and walked on and left him alone? Apparently, she got too close. <laughs> At one point, Danny was hovering over that thing yesterday. He was like, I'm like, Man, don't you get bit? And he was like, doing all this kind of stuff, you know? Uh, thankfully, it was a cold morning. And that snake was moving very slow. Thankfully, it was not a warm morning. Point being, if it has venom and you get too close and you get bit, right? So what if she had just walked away. What if she had just quit listening? But even then, Adam didn't have to eat what was forbidden. And he bit into something and he was poisoned by it. And all mankind was poisoned by it. And that's why the Messiah had to come into the world, right? To be the remedy to this. So back to my point just a moment ago. What we eat, what we ingest physically and spiritually is very important because it can be, it has the potential to be very harmful to us. And that brings us to another portion of this, another section of this portion to remind us that, you know what led to the fall of man? Eating something you weren't supposed to eat because you decided that it was food. Leviticus chapter 11 Verse one, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying to them, speak to the children of Israel saying, these are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud that you may eat. And then he goes into all the things that are not to be eaten, all those things that are considered to be food and all the things that are not considered to be food. And so one of the things I want us to take note of is that the Torah, um, as far as it's concerned, there is nothing about life that is secular. Nothing about life is secular. You know, we like to divide everything up into church, secular. All right? I was listening to church music, then I was listening to secular music. As far as God is concerned, there's nothing that touches our life that is to be considered secular. Because if he's going to deal with food... I mean, besides the relationship between a husband and wife, what is more intimate to a person than food? You think about it. 
when somebody starts messing with your food. I've, I've seen it. You know, when you start talking about food and what is food and what isn't food, and you get onto the subject what's not food, biblically speaking, it'll strike a nerve with some people. Now, <laughs> after Monday night, I want you to take charge. You want me to do that again? <laughs> she knows I'm playing. All right, food is a very intimate thing. In fact, there were certain things in this Torah portion we read that the priests were commanded to eat. They were commanded to eat it. In fact, they were told where they were to eat it and where they couldn't eat it. That's how serious he was about there are certain things that are regarded as holy. It must be kept that way. It shouldn't be crossed with things that are common. Right? So then again, the implication is that what a person eats has bearing on our spiritual calling. We're to be a holy nation in every aspect of our life. It should be that our lives are not divvied up into spiritual and secular. We should be examples and witnesses when we're on the job. We should be examples and witnesses when we're walking down the street. We should be examples when we're in, you know, in, at, at home, right? That's the way it's supposed to be as a holy people. Every aspect of our life, we are to exhibit these things that he specifies in his word. So contrary to popular thinking, the Torah addresses every point and facet of life, which kind of flies in the face of a lot of uh, cultural thinking. And some of that cultural thinking has found its way into the body, unfortunately. Because it, it, you'll see that, um, well, there's some people who have this attitude, well, God's not going to be concerned about my little bitty problem here. He's, he, he's, got too, he's got bigger things to deal with than my little problem. You've heard me tell the story about the $50 bill we found on our door that one night. Beth and I were young married couple going to church. Didn't, you know, we didn't have much at all. Certainly didn't have any money. And it was a Wednesday night. We were at church. And we knew the next morning we were going to be overdrawn by about $50. We needed $50, which I don't seem like a whole lot now, but back then it might have been, it might as well have been 50000 it, there was no way we were going to get $50. We didn't tell anybody. We just, together, we prayed that night, God, we need help. We got home that night. There was an envelope taped to the front door, and inside the envelope was a $50 bill. To this day, don't know where it come from. All right. Point being, he is concerned about every aspect of our life. The big things and the little things, and that's why he gave us his word to teach us how we conduct our lives in the big matters, in the small matters. And so it's, he's not this God that deist had made him to be. He created everything and then he went on vacation. No, he is concerned about every aspect of our lives to the fact, uh, to the uh, intent that he says, this is what you should eat and this is what you shouldn't eat because he wants us to be healthy. Well, I enjoy my pork chops. Well, enjoy them. Go on. You know, I don't believe pork chops are going to send me hell. I don't either. You just might get to heaven sooner. <laughs> he wants us to be healthy, right? So anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to really get into and emphasize, you know, why we shouldn't eat certain things. You can read it for yourself, all right? I'm not going to get into the ramifications of what happens if you do eat certain things that God says are unclean, at least not on the physical side of that. I will say this, when God says don't eat that, he means it, right? There are reasons for it. At the same time, I think there are things that are far more detrimental than a shrimp cocktail. Now, don't take that to mean that you can go out and get a shrimp cocktail. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, saying that there are things that are far more deadly than that. So here's the point. These dietary laws, as well as some other things that we find in this portion, teach us to be able to discern between clean and unclean. 
I wasn't absolutely certain that snake was a copperhead. I thought it was, but I wanted to make sure. But when we discerned that this was a venomous snake, we didn't decide, okay. So it's not enough just to discern between what is clean and unclean. When you discern that something is unclean and it's in your sacred space, it requires you to do something about it. When this thing raised its head and there was no more doubting, then we had to take action. We have to discern between what is holy and what is unclean. And if I can, where food is concerned, considering it's such an intimate part of our lives, if I can train myself, if I can discipline myself to restrain from things that God says don't do, whether I understand it or not, maybe it teaches me to discipline myself in other ways. Things that are far more important than whether or not I have a pork chop. Okay? In other words, if I ignore these laws, and from God's point of view, I eat things that are unclean, maybe that trains me to ignore other issues. Maybe that teaches me, in my mind, to ignore other things and, you know, perhaps rendering me incapable of discerning between what's clean and unclean. Because, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there, folks, that were maybe raised in a biblical home, we'll put it that way, who are no longer able to discern between what is clean and unclean because they've compromised so many times. And they can no longer see the difference between the two. Laodicea saw themselves as rich, having need of nothing. That's how they viewed themselves. How did Yeshua see them? You're naked, you're blind, and you need to repent. Right? If I compromise in one, I might be inclined to justify my appetite for other things. Someone who's been exposed to loud music over time have a tendency to say, what do you say? <laughs> and sometimes they can't distinguish audible sounds because they've been exposed to something that wasn't very helpful, wasn't very good for them. And I'm preaching to myself. I used to play in a band. We couldn't afford monitor systems. We had to stand in front of the stack of speakers. Seriously. And now I walk around, what'd you say? <laughs> but being exposed to that so much, now, you know, there's these certain sounds that it's hard to distinguish. It's hard to discern. And so if we expose ourselves to these things whereby aren't good for us, aren't lawful for us, perhaps it renders us deficient in our ability to discern between what is clean and what is unclean. So maybe there's more to these dietary, dietary laws than what some people have imagined. I know that some people want to get on, well, you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't eat that. They make it about meat and drink. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying that God tells us these things in the physical to teach us in the spiritual. Not that we throw the physical away, but they are teaching us of spiritual issues. So if we train ourselves to master our appetites physically, maybe it teaches us to train our appetites in other areas. Okay? And by the way, there's no scripture that I can find that says, thou shalt not eat Twinkies. <laughs> so maybe that means I'm supposed to eat Twinkies. But if we make a diet out of Twinkies, what's going to happen? Sugar diabetes and all kinds. So there's the principle in all of these things, right? So again, if we master our appetite for things that are physical, that God says, these are things you need to avoid, then it teaches us to discipline ourselves in other matters, to abstain from those things that we, you know, in a spiritual sense that we know are harmful because he has said it is. And if we don't do that, if we just ingest whatever we want to, we'll assume for just a moment that that's what Nadav and Avihu did. They did what, did what was right in their own eyes. They ingested something. They become intoxicated. Their, you know, their mental clarity is compromised, and now they can't distinguish between what's holy and profane 
And then they found out when it was too late, right? So if we allow ourselves to ingest things that are unclean physically, maybe that trains us to ingest things that are unclean spiritually, which brings us to this point and why the title of the message. In rabbinical thinking, the presence of one kosher sign is considered to be worse than if it has no signs of being clean. In other words, it would be best that the animal has no signs of being clean rather than to have one sign of being clean and not the other. Because you see, just one sign might mislead people into thinking that what is unclean is actually clean. This is to speak of those that you and I would call hypocrites. Or here's how Paul puts it, 2 Timothy 3, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And what does he say? From such people turn away. The Yiddish term for such a person, chazer fisel, pig's foot. That's a pig's foot. And the idea is, you see a pig laying out there in the slop, you know, in the, in the sty, and it's just, you know, rolling around in there, and you will see that that pig has a cloven hoof. But what is it missing? Doesn't chew its cud, Right? So it shows one sign of being clean, but that's the outward sign. The one that you can't see, the inside, that's what's missing. So outward appearances can be deceiving, can't they? All that glitters is not gold. Everything that's shiny, just because it looks good, sounds good, feels good, doesn't mean that it is good, right? Outward appearances are deceiving because they don't always reveal the heart. Revelation 3, since we were talking about Laodicea, He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, which is a mixture of the two, you're neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So what is this to uh, teach us in, in, in light of what we're studying this week in the Torah portion? We need to exhibit all the signs that we are his people. We don't need to do one, and then to leave the other undone. You know, there are these weightier matters of the Torah that Messiah talks about, mercy, justice, and faith. These things you should have done, but not left the others undone. Yeah, you need to tithe the mint, the kum, and the honest. You need to do the things that God tells you to do or not to do in the Torah. But you also need to make certain that in doing or not doing, you don't miss the point of what he's really trying to say here. And you and I need to be able to discern between clean and unclean. We need to exhibit all the signs of being a holy people. Because to be mixed with the unclean deceives ourselves and it deceives others. I believe that there are a lot of people who really believe that God is endorsing how they're living. Because they're deceived. They're deceived. And they're deceiving others. Don't be deceived. Right? So don't just produce those outward signs. Matthew 23, verses 25 and 6. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, pig's feet. You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Here's a very important point. Culture is not dependable when it comes to pronouncing what is clean and unclean. If you get your uh, spiritual, uh, what's the word, grounding from Instagram, you're in trouble. (laughs) If what others are putting on, well, it's not Twitter anymore, it's X, right? Or what they're putting on, was it TikTok? Something like that, tic-tac, tic-toc, whatever it is. If that's where you get your understanding of how things should be, you're in trouble, all right? Same can be said for NBC, CNB, uh, CN, whatever it is, MSNBC, all right? Fox, 
if, if that's where we get our understanding of what's right and wrong, clean and unclean, we're in trouble, right? The culture cannot be depended to determine what is clean and unclean. So just because culture considers something to be lawful doesn't mean that it is lawful. In fact, there are some things that this culture calls lawful that the Bible calls lawless, right? Yeah. That's something, by the way, that more, more than the sun, moon, and stars and things like that, that we need, to, those are signs, but the things that we need to be really aware of, one of them, if you read Matthew 24, in fact, the first thing Messiah says that we need to be on alert about is deception and the lawlessness that comes with it, right? So then, we know he's coming, and because we know this, there are things that we need to be doing in, preparating, uh, in preparation for this. There are things that we need to do. There are things that we don't need to do. And so we're going to have to continually discern, continually distinguish between clean and unclean. And sometimes, you know, it's not so obvious. I thought it was a copperhead, but I had, we had to wait until it showed its head to make certain. But then when it did that, out. So we have to be continually in the frame of mind to distinguish between what's clean and unclean. Because if we don't, chances are we're going to be bitten by culture's venom. And then what's more frightening, if we are bitten by culture's venom, then we might be more inclined to ingest and eat things that are poisonous. Because again, just because it sparkles and shines doesn't mean that it's from God. Just because it sounds angelic doesn't mean that it's holy. Eve determined that the tree was good for food. She decided. She decided it was good for food. She decided that it was pleasant to look at. She decided that it was desirable to make, make, make them wise. But what she overlooked is that it rendered death. So I'm going to close with something uh, kind of a personal experience, but I'm going to read this passage first in Leviticus 11, verse 29. In the Torah portion, it says, There also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the mole, the mouse, and the large lizard after its kind. In other words, don't eat that stuff. Now, to me, that's the no-brainer right there. I don't even, you don't have to tell me that. I'm not eating that. But you need to keep in mind that as far as God is concerned, eating a mouse, eating a lizard, eating any of that kind of jazz is just detestable to him as eating pig. Take it for what it's worth. But that's not really my point. The Hebrew word that is translated mouse or rat is akhbar. Now, where have I heard that before? Akbar, Akbar, Akbar. It, it seems like there are some people in this world who call a certain deity a rat. When I saw, first time I saw that, I'm like, oh my word. God really does have a sense of humor. All right, but back to the point. Akbar is the word for mouse or rat. And now there are some people in this world who think that mice are cute. <laughs> and they think, oh, oh, it's so cute, little buddy, little buddy. <laughs> and they may be cute, but in regards to food, they are unclean. They're, you know, anyway, right? <laughs> and, they, and then the bigger version, rats, ugh. I, I hate them. I can't even begin to tell you how much I hate rats. <laughs> if a rat ran here in this room, I would jump on a table and scream like a little girl. <laughs> I have done that before. <laughs> and I was telling my wife, kill it, kill it, kill it. <laughs> Not a mouse, a rat. They're the most vile, disgusting creatures on the face of the earth. Why, oh Lord, did you 
Did you make rats? But I have reason for telling you this, okay? The Hebrew word achbar comes from the idea of nibbling. Nibbling. But it's also a word that means troubling, something that renders destruction. Things that nibble at first bring destruction. If you've ever had a mouse in your house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Nibbling just a little bit at the time until it develops into a major problem. All right, so that's the little mouse, but then there are larger, more disgusting cousins, the rats. Oh. <laughs> I had a dream many years ago, and I think I've shared this with you before, but I had a dream, it's been several years ago, and it was at a point in our lives where there were certain opportunities that were being given to me to go into certain places and teach and speak and this, that, and the other. And, you know, and um, I don't know. Be associated with people that if I called your name, you'd all recognize them, this kind of a thing. One night, I had a dream. And I was sitting, sitting in our living room at, at, a, at the coffee table. Knock comes on the door, and these, this group of men comes into the house. And a couple of them, I know who they were. If I called their name, you'd know who they were. And they came, and they had this big silver tray with the cupboard, you know, the whole fancy thing. And this one man in particular, he brought this big silver tray, and he set it in front of me. And he said, if you'll eat that, then this is what we'll do for you. And I took the cover. It was a big rat. <laughs> and my reaction was, I can't eat that. That's disgusting. That's unclean. I can't eat that. If you don't eat that, then you'll never be able to do this. I said, I can't eat that. So I took that and I went out in the back and I threw it over a fence and I got rid of it. They left and things changed for me and for, for us in a way that the, certain things that never happened. And I don't regret that. It's just what I'm saying is that we need to be careful of what we allow to enter in to our being. We need to be careful about what we ingest. If we ingest what is unclean and what is deadly, not only is it going to harm us, but it has the potential to affect others. Because let's just say I ate the rat and did what people wanted me to do. Chances are we wouldn't be here right now. At least Beth and I wouldn't be here right now, right? So it has, a, it has the potential to impact others in a negative way. Because when people are deceived, they deceive others, right? Okay? So being intoxicated, like native and avihu, if we, if, if we assume that's what happened, and we do things that satisfy the flesh, it has the potential anyway to prevent us from functioning in our purpose, to derail God's purpose for us and maybe for others. So what we consume is what we're going to pass. I hate to put it that way, but that's just the way it is, right? What you consume is what's going to go out of you. If you're on a heavy diet of CNN and Fox and, uh, you know, or some of this vile music and stuff like that, if that's what's going in, eh, that's what's going to come out and it's going to get passed on to others. If you're consuming an abundance of despair and conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff, guess what? That's what you're going to pass on to others. If you're consuming what only has the appearance of godliness but denies the power thereof, that's what you're going to mimic and pass on to others. So let us not be slaves to things that are unclean. Let's not be slaves to things that are to satisfy our own lusts, our own desires. He is coming. It's a done deal. We don't know when, we don't know the hour, but we know that he's coming. And when we're seeing things going on, like what's going to happen on Monday, what does he say? You should know that the time of your redemption is at hand. You should know that these things are at the door. And if we know that there are things that we need to be doing, there are things that we don't need to be doing. There are things that we need to wake up and, you know, rouse ourselves and become sober because he is coming. We want to be ready when he comes, right? 
We don't want to be beating one another up and all those things. We want to be attentive. We want to be alert. We want to be sober. We want to be on watch, doing our Father's business when he appears. And so then, if we're going to be able to do that, we have to abstain from the deeds, the words, the attitudes that poison us. We need to be careful about those venomous snakes. Don't coexist with them. Don't pet them. Don't think you can tame them. Don't think that I can save them. And watch out for those pig's feet. They look good on the outside, but inside, they're still unclean. We need to be careful about those things. Amen? Beth, you'll come and, and close this out here, this part anyway. Well, I feel we've received a warning today. How about you? Yes. Even though we have received a warning, which can sometimes feel heavy, I think it's a great day. And I feel so light. I still believe winter has passed and the springtime has come. But as he brought to our attention, springtime brings forth a different creature and we're used to the ones we've been dealing with in the winter time and just because we're entering in springtime doesn't mean the enemy's taking a break right so we have to always be vigilant to guard so while we were singing in praise and worship this morning which is one I will definitely be listening to again in my car how many of you do that during the week you listen to it in your car you put it on it's like are you played in your home I love it um when I get a chance to do that, I love it. And I feel the anointing all over again. So praise team, thank you for that. Thank you for your obedience and for, yes, amen. Give the Father a, a praise for the beautiful praise team that he's put together here. And I thank you for their dedication. Um, it's not easy what they do. And so again, I will be listening to that uh, again this week. But while we were singing some of those songs, Every one of them, when I raise my hand, it's like, Father, I'm surrendering to you. It applies to me. You know, do this in me, to me, through me. But at the same time, I'm thinking about the wayward ones. There's a whole group of people out there who have no idea the goodness of what we get to taste every week, week after week. And that's so sad. And then there are people out there who have tasted it and they've done this. I'll do what I want to do. And that's who my heart goes out to. And while we pray the things that we pray for ourselves, let's not be selfish and pray it only for ourselves. Let's always apply it to those who either don't know or who do know and have turned their back. And they think, like Bill said, they, they've deceived themselves. They think that they're doing, they have that you know, form of godliness. And they think they're walking in his power. First of all, let us not ever find ourselves in that position. We should always be before him, asking him, search me. I don't want to be that way. If there's anything, you know, and what's the saying? Nature abhors a void. If you pluck up a weed, nature's ready to put something else there because God created it to be fruitful, right? To bring forth life. But when you pluck up a weed, immediately plant something there that is going to bring forth the right kind of fruit. Yes, I know my gardener friends who have that green thumb that I try not to covet. I know that even weeds have value and they can bring nitrogen and things to the soil. I, I understand that. But when you're on a mission to, you know, prepare that ground for the, that one thing that you know you're supposed to plant there that's bringing forth that fruit, we do have to clear it of the weeds and put the right things in there. So anyway, getting back to what I was, the Father impressed on me this morning while we were in praise and worship was, um, we, we saying, put a fire in our soul, put a fire in my soul that can't, that I can't contain, that I can't control. 
And so I prayed that for me. And then as we sang it, I started praying it for them. Put a fire in their soul that they can't contain, that they can't control. And I prayed, may the wayward ones become just as brazen for you as they have been against you. Now let's think about that for a minute. First of all, when we were in the world, what, what did we behave like? To me, it's nauseating to look back and think of some of the things that I said and did when I was younger before I really truly surrendered to him. And we were all brazen. So when we prayed that prayer, let it not be, oh, those brazen, you know, let, yeah, get them, sick them, you know. We were once that way. So pray it with compassion, but with determination. And now think about being on the receiving end of some of the brazenness of those who are wayward and how hurtful that is. And if it's that hurtful to us, think of how hurtful it is to the Father. Now think about how overjoyed we are when we know some who have been brazen have now come back. That has actually happened within Jacob's tent. God has done that. And I am so thankful for the boldness of people to come and repent to the Father and do the hard work to be reconciled. A coward can't do that. And now think about how happy the Father is when their brazenness towards him has now become brazenness against the enemy because they're back in the right camp. So that's my prayer. May their brazenness against you become, they become that brazen for you. I pray that he crushes the pride and replaces it with humility. It's the pride that keep, keeps people from saying, I made a mistake. That keeps them going in that wrong direction because they, want, they don't want to feel they have lost the battle. You know, we all know, we've been there, we still have those things that we hang on to. Maybe it's a, an argument with your spouse or your child or your boss or you know, an in-law or somebody. Nobody likes to feel like they're the loser. Nobody likes to feel like they're defeated or, ooh, I made a big bad mistake. That's pride. We gotta let it go. And if we can let it go, we will be an example to others who need to let it go. And that's my prayer for us and for them. Crush the pride and replace it with humility. With humility, you can accomplish so much. With humility, he can be powerful in you because then it's about him getting the glory and not you. Like Bill said, he's a little wary of people who are rushing to be the leader. And, you know, let's check our humility. Let us, and when I pray us, I also pray them, abandon the feel-goods of the lust of the world and crave what we sang about today, the sweetness of his love. The world tells you, oh, this feels good. Just keep doing it. It's okay. God will get it. He understands. You know, you, you had a rough life. You know, your, your childhood was tough or this person picked on you or they didn't treat you right or they said this about you or like you were ripped off or you were cheated out of a job. It's okay. God gets it. Just behave that way. He's not petting you. He does not pet copperheads. Don't be deceived. Don't be a deceiver. Let them abandon the feel goods of the lust of the world and crave the sweetness of his love. That's what truly feels good and brings peace. So my prayer is for all of us and for all of them that God will meddle in our plans if they're only ours. That he will loosen the chariot wheels of the enemies and point out what his plan is and bring us back to that path and bring them back to that path. Uh, this week, a lot of different things have been brought to my attention, trials that people are going through, things that have come to their attention, difficulties. Um, and so I just, I won't claim credit for it because I don't know where it came from. The father just popped it into my head. I'm, I'm, I don't know where it came from in the world. 
the father is the one who just popped this into my head. And it was, Haman was smug until he was snug in the gallows. Okay? Let's not be Haman. We haven't arrived. But let's also be aware of the Hamans that are out there. Don't get caught up with it. So I pray, you know, God chop off the heads of the serpents so they don't have the ability to rise or strike again. When he told me what happened at first, my first thought was, oh, why are you telling me this? Thank, thank God it was a cold morning. I mean, as he said, what if it had not been? We'd had some warm days. What if it had, it had been a warm day? It might've been a different story, but it wasn't. And I thank him for it. But as soon as he told me there were two, I immediately went to, I know the names of these two serpents and they are the embodiment of the spirits that have thought they have dominated during the winter. And they're gonna come crawling around in the springtime and still try to wreak havoc. But the father says, no, lop off their heads. Not only lop off their heads, what did y'all do, Danny? You went and buried them, right? He went and buried the heads. You know why? Why, Danny? Okay, because it still secretes venom. So it's not just enough to lop off the head. You gotta put some distance there. You gotta bury those things. You still, if you get too close, even after the head is lopped off, it can still affect you. So don't be deceived and thinking, well, I can play around here now. No. He says, stay away from those things. So they lopped off the head and they buried it just to make sure it can't rise or strike again because that's how our Father works. He wants us to do it thoroughly. So... I know I'm only rehashing some of the things that Bill has already said, and, but when that happens, I know it's the Holy Spirit because I have no idea what he's going to say in the mornings. Um, we just don't have that kind of time to talk about it. And I think that's the Father's plan because then the Holy Spirit can work. And sometimes I've asked him recently, what, what in the world are you going to bring out of this portion? He goes, well, you just have to wait and see. I don't want to tell you. I'm like you know what? I'm glad. I don't want to know. And because then the Holy Spirit works. But if, if I'm just going to say it. He spoke boldly. I'll spoke, speak boldly too. If you are a snake coddler, stop it. It's time to stop. Today's the day. Because you're not playing with just your life. You're playing with the lives of others. Don't be offended if you're a snake coddler and you choose to keep coddling snakes if people start stepping back from you. You made the choice. Okay? If that offends you, ask the Father why. Don't be afraid to lop off the head of the serpent because you might lose a relationship. What's more important, this relationship or that relationship? Because if you have this one right, he's going to take care of those. And maybe the one you're afraid of losing is one you don't need in the first place. Just think about it. Okay, I got a little preachy there. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Well, but I'm not sorry for what he told me to say because it's not my words, it's his. And I stand by it because he stands by it. And it is life-giving. And that's what he's all about. We're not about death here. So serpents, be gone. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Yes. Give him a praise. I am a little Baptocostal in case you didn't know. Ultimately, let us all be found uncompromising and clean before him. Let us respect his holiness. His holiness, not our way, not what we think is holy, not what we've convinced ourselves is holy, but him, what is truly holy. So let us take everything to him before we act on it and make sure it's pleasing to him. Amen? Okay. If you will stand with me. And let's go to the Father in prayer. And I want to bring Adrian Peterson up before you. Um, the, the latest report I got is that he is doing well. And uh, hopefully they'll be back with us very soon. Um, I'll, and pray for Debbie. You know, when um, your other half is down 
it's hard on you too. You know, you're concerned about them. You lose sleep. You're, you're taking care of them. You're on double duty. And so pray for Debbie as well. Um, Adrian's the one who had the procedure, but uh, Debbie needs our prayer just as much. So pray for both of them. Also want to uh, keep the Vanderhaegs on your heart. Um, things are changing in... Uh, I won't go into all the details, but you know, some things are changing for them, and uh, we just need to keep them in prayer that the Father will um, show them where they need to go, what they need to do, and, and how to do it, and that he'll have the provisions there for them when they get there. I know that's how he operates, but I pray for them to have a peace in that, and for whatever our responsibility is as a body, um, he'll show us what we need to do, and that goes not just for these people. Uh, I know that the tribe has been wonderful to um, Adrian and, and Debbie to k take the meals and check on them and everything. And that's what we're supposed to do. And I just love when I came in this morning, just the joy that I felt in the building. Everybody just seemed so happy, so excited, talking. Um, whoever comes up to pray, I almost feel sorry for them, but, but not really, you know, because it's... We're just so happy to be seeing each other, greeting each other, talking and enjoying, enjoying each other that it's hard to get us to settle down. And I love walking into that. Like Celso said, why did we ever run from that? Why did we ever shun that? What was wrong with us? Because that's what really feels good. That's where peace is. So when we pray, pray for these people I mentioned, anybody else that you know who has any physical need or any other need, but let's pray for the wayward ones. That seems to be the theme lately. And I, I, the Father's doing something. We had more reports come in this week of uh, people who have been estranged and the phone calls came in, uh, two of them in one day uh, that a parent was telling me about. And then I, there were two others that I was told about. So I've, I've had a, a bunch of things reported to me over the past week that are just wonderful examples that the Father is alive and well and working right now. So let's keep those people in prayer. Let's go to him now. Oh, gracious King, mighty one, you see all, you know all, and you've been through all of it, Father. There's nothing that we can go through that you don't already know about, you haven't already experienced. You created us. You know everything there is to know about us, Father things we'll never, never even know about ourselves, you know. And I thank you for that, the confidence that we have, the security that, that gives us, Father. And, and knowing that we're capable of carrying out what you've called us to do, because you know what we're capable of. And so, Father, when you challenge us, let us always remember us, because you know what we're capable of, and you know we can do more. Help us never to settle for just enough but to go all the way for your purpose. Father, I pray now for all of us and especially for the wayward ones, Father. Let their hearts feel like they're gonna pound out of their chest, Father. Let them crave you like a person who's been in the desert for a hundred years without a drop of water, Father. Let them crave you like nothing they've ever craved before in their lives. Let them run to you, Father. Place that fire in them that they just, they can't contain, Father. They can't control. And let them be as brazen for you as they have been against you, Father. Father, if there are any of us here who need to separate from the copperheads, Give us the strength to do that. Show us. Show us where they are, Father. Give us the ability, the discernment to recognize it. And give us the courage to lop their heads off and bury them, Father, so that they are powerless and lifeless to ever raise their heads again and ever strike again. Help us be an example to our family, to our children, to those who are watching, Father, of the power of your kingdom. And speaking of that power, Father, I pray that you would apply that power now to Adrian and Debbie, to the Vander Hags, and to all of the others who need a touch from you, Father, a healing touch in their body, or if it's in a relationship, Father, whatever it may be, 
You already have the answer, Father. And just help us to learn the things between the asking and the receiving that we need to learn because you've already answered. Help us to not rush to the answer, but to learn the things along the way to get to the answer so that we don't have to go through it again. You're so mighty. We're so undeserving. Let us love you and love each other in a way that's pleasing to you, Father. We bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. If you have a little one in the nursery, I want to excuse you, go get the get the babies and come on back down here so we can have kiddish together, have the blessing together. And if you have prepared and have a willing heart, we want to invite you to come forward now and present your offering unto the Lord. Uh, if you're at home and you wish to participate in this act of worship, we want to invite you to do that at this time as well. Diana. While we're waiting on our parents to bring our littlest treasures back down, um, first of all, I want to go ahead and recognize our first-time visitors. If that's you, if you'll go ahead and raise your hand nice and high. First-time visitors. Okay, we have some over here. Yeah, some there, some here, right there. Got one over here. Okay, some more over here. Yeah, very good. So now, um, Rafael y Ophelia. Okay, bienvenidos. This is... Diana's parents who've come for, from Tucson yes, for some special event that's going on uh, Monday. Oh, a wedding. <laughs> so anyway, we're happy that you're here. Very happy you're here. And also, I, I didn't ask if I could do this, but Mel's uncle is here, Bob. Bob, what is your last name? I'm so sorry. Boston. Yeah. Bob Boston. Okay, that's easy enough. So uh, you were a missionary for most of your life down in Paraguay and Peru. Paraguay and, Peru. and so um, if you get a chance, shake his hand. I'm sure he has some interesting things that he can tell you. And we're glad that you stopped by to visit today. And he's also a first time visitor. So thank you, Mel, for influencing him to come here. So I know he's that uh, we're not the only reason that Mel is here. So <laughs> he wants to visit with her. So anyway, any of the visitors that are here, we have um, a quick reception out in the foyer. I missed something, apparently. Did I miss say something? I'm, uh... 
Okay, I'll have to go back to watch. It, it's it's it sounded like you said that we're not the only reason that Mel is here. No, we're not the only reason that Bob is here because Mel is here. Yeah, but that's not what you said. <laughs> Well, the other is true, too. I mean, we're going to be transparent. We're not going to lie about this thing. Duh. So I'll just say we're super happy both of you are here. <laughs> yeah. So now that some people have changed skin colors today, we'll move on. <laughs> no. Anyway, all of our first-time guests... Um, please join us, if you will, in the foyer where you came in this morning, just briefly. We know you're hungry. We want to get to, uh, to lunch. We want to shake your hand, share a hug if you're good with that. And with that, let's turn around and greet the rest of our family behind camera number two, where Ms. Laurie faithfully stands. Just let them hear you as the camera comes by. Shabbat shalom. Okay, and with that, I think we're ready for the blessing. Are we good upstairs? Okay. All right. Yes, everybody, let's remain standing for the blessing. Amen. Uh, I'm excited that at Shavuot, uh, the young lady who wrote the original version of what we just sang, Misha Getz, will be joining us with her dad, Marty, and some other amazing guests. So, yeah, so I'm happy to, uh, I'm looking forward to that. There'll be more on that at Passover, but just wanted to um, just give that little plug there because uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that song and the way that we sing it. Okay, so let's see, where are we? Um, who's having a tribe lunch today? Benjamin. Okay. Benjamin is going to be over here by the windows. Remember, we have tables over in this next room for those who cannot navigate the stairs. And remember, our prayer team, Bob and Marlene, have designated the uh, prayer team members that are going to be over here to pray. And so just keep that in mind if you're exiting the building out this door, that they will be in this corner over here. So let's make sure that we're respectful of that. Um, and let's see, I guess with that, we're ready for Kiddush. Just just about. So are you going to entertain us for a minute? No, no. 
Well, Mike's delivering the message right now, but I need all of the Fullwoods and the Davises and the Ruiz. I want y'all to come up and lead us in, in the Kiddish and Hamotzi, please. need a bigger stage <laughs> All right. everyone would join us in uh, the blessing over the Jews Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Malach Olam Borei Peri Hagape Amen Blessed are you O Lord our God King of the universe creates the fruit of the vine, and forgiving us, Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, and you are the branch, like I am. That's all right, Bob, it happens to all of us. We've only been doing it for five years, just playing. Y'all want some, no, I'm playing. Y'all want some bread? Pass it down and then give it to Melissa. But we always want to remind everybody that the most important thing we can address and resolve today is to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through his son, Yeshua the Messiah and who is the bread of life, who came down from heaven to not only chase the serpent out of the garden, but to crush his head and destroy the works of the devil, that you and I might be called the sons and daughters of God. Amen. And so if you do not have that relationship, today is the day of salvation. Amen. All righty. Is there anything else we need to address? Um, this beautiful family up here, these families, they're all connected through children and grandchildren. And I believe the younger Ruizes are about to, uh, like 15 weeks, they put on social media, so it's okay for me to say something. <laughs> about 15 weeks, they are going to provide the next member of Jacob's tent that we get to hold, love, and cuddle. So. They don't look excited, any of them, do they, right? <laughs> so, sure. So we just wanted to go ahead and say that we don't know the full name yet, but our daughter's name is going to be Eliana. So. That's very nice. Eliana. Yeah? Well, very good. Well, very good. And then not, we don't have a middle name yet, right? Not, not like Gladys or, you know, anything like that, right? Not no. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you so much. Okay. We don't want to keep y'all any longer 
than we already have. Um, we do want to say goodbye to our streamers and we'll see you at 3.30 for Kiddish. All you're missing is us dismissing everybody at this point. So we love you. We'll see you in a little bit. Okay.